would like to say thank you to everybody who bought a book and everybody who's here uh, giving their support to, to Tony uh, and Ghost Town. Thank you. Uh, we've made it just about halfway through the list that we have, so we're now on number nine, and our number nine reader is yeah. Bruce Hall. Please say hello to Bruce. Hey. They're great, come, come enjoy. Uh, back before I was young, they say the world was perfect. Back before I was young, they say a fortune was there for the taking. Back before I was young, they say disease did not exist. Back before I was young, they say the world turned on the axis. The sun circling the earth in the opposite direction. Back before I was young, they say salmon ran thick in the rivers, never stinking when they died. Back before I was young, they say trees were stunted with a lack of carbon dioxide. Back before I was young, they say bullshit flowed in the streets. Sorry, it still does. <laughs> This is one from a prompt Christopher had. Citizens respond to gun violence. A beat down, fists and feet, thrown as sport or domestic violence. Little or no response. Perhaps it is the modifier for violence that holds their reaction in check. Bomb violence, blunt force object violence, protest violence, no, nope, people seem only to react to gun violence. Could it be no the noise? Up close and personal or at a distance? Both loud. Glinting in the sun, rose red, knife violence, intimate. Breaking news, this could be disturbing, not for all audiences. Man with a knife, middle of the street. About 30 police officers, all pointing glocks. The 31st pulls up, yells the same thing as the others. Drop it, drop it, drop it. 30 feet away, fires. One fires, they all fire. You're walking down the street, waiting at the bus stop, talking on the phone. Boom! That knee-jerk reaction. Did the gun start the violence, or did it end the violence? Did it prevent the violence? How would people react if the gun stood alone? Divorced violence. The AK-47 walks down the street, extra clips on the ammo belt, past the former workplace, past the event center, past the school, goes into the bar, has a couple of beverages, goes home. Violence is no longer part of the gun's life. Peace peace, and still peace. Stunned that I'm wearing many hats. I was wearing one of the one of them, and that's why the dead air. But I mean, I think after the 
white hot intensity of the first half where you need to take a breath, right? So <laughs> there is your chance to take a breath, and now it's just going to be rock and roll all the way through to the end. So please welcome our first rock and rolling poet, Christine Lamlight. Hi, everybody. Hey. This poem is dedicated to Bob, who left already, but made me read it to him. And uh, it's funny how God plays such synchronicity because I brought a poem that was my very first poem. And the one I wrote that dedicated to Bob is my very most recent one. So they kind of bookend. So anyway, I'm going to read that one, my latest one, first. I just wrote it while I was sitting over there. And it's called The Red Couch. My sister never liked me. Two years older, she was the first. In her plans, it should stay that way. But what was a 12-year-old to do? I liked places that were secret, places to hide, at least for a while. It was an opportune time. Over the phone, the date was made. Prettily seated on the red couch was this blonde in waiting sister for that boyfriend and the high school date. I was too. Waiting crouched behind the space behind couch and wall, waiting for the talking to die down, waiting to hear smashy lips meet, that I, that I announced their treat, a pop-up girl, surprise, and then I ran. <laughs> This one is about my grandmother's mahogany desk that I couldn't stay out of in childhood. And I thought it contained all the answers I ever wanted and to all the questions I'd ever thought. I was in trouble a lot about being in the desk, but soon it became mine. And my cat, uh, Emily, my editor, took over it. And here's the piece we both wrote together. And it's called Author Eyes. The childhood desk drawers, imprints of small teeth, looking for something inside beautiful mahogany. Mesmerized by contents, curiosity unfolds. Frightened by consequences to do as I'm told. The desk is an hinterland, an island awake, clean, white, and stark, though nothing to say. Investigations of nightmares following clues, sniffing out daylight in the black and the blues. Compartments of memories forbidden to see, writing materials from a family tree. Possessed with my pain, Obsessed to regain the scattered fragments of childhood terrain. Sorting out pieces, digging up news, putting in categories childhood abuse. Voices got louder, er eruptions of life. Drive me to secrets, silence the knife. The clock on the mantle, the hands stop and stare. And somewhere in time, the answer lies there. As each year passes, mine's memory of loss, I'm strangely attracted, desk outline and lost. Barren and dry, dusty and crude, sweating out waiting the buds that elude. The freedom is filthy, no boundaries to know. Wandering new lands, what seeds will I sow? Airing the files, exposing the prose, old manuscripts and stories, in sunlight they grow. Flourishing fields, such a harvest, so sweet. Crops of abundance, I squirm in my seat. Memories flooding, the fountain just flows, 
The keys on the typewriter are tapping their toes. The armies come marching across clean white sheets, swearing the secrets to truth, dare they please. Like flames to the fire, we flicker with thought. The memories crackle, take what the soul's got. I knew it would come to this. We'd sit and we'd write. The critic pokes madly, intruding on life. Pieces are turned out, patterns from notes, homework in process, quests out of quotes. The words rush like waves as they rise and they swell, delivering children from fear's silent spell. <coughs> Keeping an eye out and sneaking around, fishing through desk drawers suddenly found. Pupils are magnified. Eyes truly see, author eyes that which is gathered inside beautiful mahogany. Thanks, Christine. for my buddy, Scotty Carstens. Come on up, man. <laughs> I wore a really ironic and hypocritical shirt because this poem was vile. <laughs> but uh, I guess I get a pass to that. Um, Snail mail from your dad, what the fuck is this? Oh, why well, won't be visiting the Pacific Northwest this year, paragraph. What the city fuck? This cork soaker then goes on to explain he has been wrestling with his actions as a father to his son, apologizing for not being there emotionally and ghost because of his own anger problems. Not good enough a slap to the face. He then goes on to guilt me for him not being a part of my family. I mean, he has seen his granddaughter only twice in her 11 year life, his grandson thrice, and my own mental health boundaries are the reason why he is now not a part? What the blue city fuck is going on? Twilight Zone shit right here. Because he should be apologizing for smashing my mom in the mouth, making special paddles that night in the beating shed, yeah, that should be his words for the picture CPS had to Polaroid right my black and purple ass, for them dragging us out of the house for the summer in foster care, missing my only all-star baseball game. The, black, the flashbacks of my brother bare ass over your knee, screaming for help. Me just beaten, watching, unable to help my kid brother. PTSD, fuck you, dad. Thank you. Scotty knows I've been dealing with some of my own shit with my father. And the only reason I won't be reading poems like that tonight are because <laughs> we're here to celebrate Tony, but I promised him that there should be at least one by, by next month's reading. <laughs> gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a thing, except we're gonna, we're gonna try to be sensitive, mindful men instead of assholes like those Iron John motherfuckers, you know what I mean? Me and Scotty and whoever else wants to jump in on the, you know, Fucked up forever by our dad's club here in Vancouver. Okay, and now let's say hello to Joanne Boswell. Thank you. Um, I just uh, got an email this week and I had a poem accepted by Mothers Always Right. Um, and I'm super excited. So I decided I would. Uh, read the one that they accepted, and then another one I've written since then that's kind of a follow-up. 
I've read for you guys two poems that are a, kind of a thing I'm doing where I'm writing a poem about the best day I can remember of any month. Um, so that's any month for the, the, the month of January of any year. What's the best January day I've ever had? Um, and I've read for you guys November in the past and August. So I'll read you. For your lifetime? For my lifetime. Like what's the best day I can remember in January of any year? Up, up until, you know, this year. Um, so I'm going to read January and then June, and both of them are um, written for my oldest daughter, Clara. Your first home was inside of me during Snowpocalypse 2012. Our apartment in Olympia lost power twice during that season, and snow days drifted high at June's end, teaching on pause and Tech Week skipped a midsummer night's dream stuck in winter. Your father and I alternated between snuggly couch movie binging and childlike wonderland adventuring, the most snow either of us had seen at our homes. We layered in clothing, jeans on jeans, shirt on shirt on shirt on pea coat, Miscellaneous wardrobe scroungings, doubleting us snow tourists, topping our look with gloves, hat, camera. Owl print lady rain boots shared with him, sink deep like my pastel plaid ones. March in exaggerated slow-mo, laughing, lift leg from hip, then crash down again. Fresh powder compressed with old, Knee deep, we trudge merrily along. Four blocks to Capitol Mall go slow. City shut down. Snow silencing, six lanes of traffic. Intersections still. Magically eerie, we stand there in the center. We hold our breaths to hear nothing. Then just echoing crunch of a willow goldfinch crossing to yon yonder vacant olive garden. Survey vast blanket ahead of us. Look back at our tracks. Indentations dotting perfection. Much like a bird on stilt-like chopsticks waltzing across an enormous bowl of sticky rice. Twelve weeks with you. I'm tired, but happy. We work our way back home, uphill, chilled. Go in while he stays out to create life-size snow people. Snowy portraits of snow us, with you windowed inside middle ball of snow lady, tiny snow baby, size of a clementine, complete with stick umbilical cord, connected to sm small snow placenta, providing snow nutrients, of course. Perchance this is how our neighbors learned, and local fairies too, if they are. You exist, our frozen announcement. And this one is June. Your first home was inside of me. Teensy closet space, but cozy. You say you remember swimming, fish-like fluttering, hungry, <laughs> darting around seeking crumbs. My interior filled with broken down food, plus water for splashing. So fondly you regurgitate this tale, I don't have the heart to tell you the truth. My placenta was diseased, which means you were hungry. Evicted two months early, tiny even for your gestation, under three pounds, you drew breath alone. A full week of fog before I found myself here, rooming with you again, finally. I take you in leisurely. Swallow your details, slow sips. Gasping white blonde charms my breath to absence. Crystal clear sky-colored ponds flood your face open wonder. Fingernails reach tracing paper across my giantess palm. My untouched coffee admires you too, tabled by Nikki Rocker, as I straw surprises into newfound mother's memory. My cowlick spirals your forehead, while your daddy's solo dimple winks from your left cheek. Features I never imagined could be hereditary. 
I perch, reclining recovery, beside your second home. Stroke a finger down your spine. Avoid tangles of tubing and wires. Caffeinated by your existence, caterpillar, cocooning, and isolate, I will you butterfly free. Find your third home in my arms. Hey, check out what Steven's got. If you've never had one of these tarts, I have one on order. I thought that was mine, and I almost started eating it, and he said, this is not for you. <laughs> they're that fucking good, people. Buy a tart, they're good. I guess tart is like French for, uh, for pizza or something like that. Yeah, it's basically like a flaky French pizza. You'll be happy that you, that you said yes to the tart. Um, I really feel strongly that, that we need to uh, pronounce each other's names properly as a matter of respect. Sometimes there are people who can't write worth the shit. <laughs> I mean, we just do the best that we can, with, but this is not one of those situations. This person has fine and fine handwriting, and I just found out tonight that I've been saying his last name wrong for a really long time. So I want to publicly apologize to him and pronounce his name correctly for the first time since he's been coming. Here is Rob Severson, everybody. Just to shed our own our old vessel and grow, growing our new crop of bamboo. Inter interrelational treasure maps lead me back to myself in a room with a mirror. The mirror looks back, trying to connect, trying to learn what I need, learning, self-reflecting, new notes, chords, harmonies. Trying to see the moon, trying to see the moon, the forebo foreboding shadows interrupt, growing, learning, healing, expanding, seeing the world in a different light, or better yet, connecting with myself. Turning now, to, turning now to Reiki therapy to heal and expand, she touches the bionic energy, accepted, opening, inhaling the certain the serene, exhaling the debris, the past childhood of emotional abandonment, the scars, the walls built to protect, but yes, walls create boundaries between not only humanity, race, but between us and our true selves. Our fabricated spirits push on, blame, blame, blame. I'm worthy of a place, I'm worthy of peace and being whole, but I'm responsible to close the doors that aren't needed, opening new doors. I'm the creator of a new sound, the sound of equilibrium. The moonlight appears and leads me back to a lab where I must create a new formula. And this one is about uh, my childhood and just uh, it was actually inspired at uh, Chris's, one of his workshops. I highly recommend his workshops are freaking awesome. So um, it was like a Saturday workshop and it was about, I think the subject matter had to do with uh, like childhood experiences and like maybe a story about our childhood, but my childhood is full of stories. So it's hard to like choose. So I just kind of, this is kind of a summary. It's called Run Out. Running to the hill to flee. Shown the door a time or two. Go play. Go play, my parents repeated. With the fleet of foot and ravenous imagination, the parental control quickly faded to the rear view. Youthful hills and archaic, arch, archaic architecture, we built forts and trees, meadows, and above the creek beds. Motorcycles, canoes, bikes, blisters, trips to the ER, reclamation projects around every corner. 
treacherous hikes, playing chickens, playing chicken with our bikes, egging cars, tying ropes across the road, the acts of feral children, but we were happy. The freedom lived inside our hearts. Rural kids with a healthy amount of naivete, traveling in packs and tribes. We wrote our own stories. Life seemed like a movie of make-believe magic simultaneously mixed with breakage and folly. The escape route led us away from the adults and their seemingly tortured selves. Though there was a resting spot, a respite of sorts, Flora's house. She was probably about 75, 80 years old. And uh, we would, where she would just have an amazing amount of cookies and lemonade. We wondered if she had her own cookie factory under her house. And she had a crew slaving through the night. There were power lines and riverbeds and rope swings, pickup games, chipped teeth, hurt feelings, a men's maid and friendships that continue to grow today. Hawks circled, crows squawked, sparrows darted in and out of the barn. Doors ajar, constant chores, farms anew, mowing lawns, it kept us tough and true. No downtime or playdates. Those days seemed so close, but so far away. But the dream still visits though. feedback there, so I may uh, shift this. I want to tell people, if you've never, thank you, if you've never um, sat in the front row, <laughs> I, I'm the person that I would love to, I don't do it because neither Tony nor my son would allow it, but I would probably be in the front row at every movie. I like the larger in life experience. If you want the IMAX experience of the Ghost Down Poetry Open Mic, there's three, at least three seats here where you can have that experience right now. And it's totally different. I experienced Rob in a way that I've never experienced him before. It was fucking cool. <laughs> if you can handle the intensity of Severson. Um, also, Severson, you know, I'm going to say it a lot so I can get used to it and do it right next time, was kind enough to mention the workshop. There are two of them coming up very shortly. Uh, one at Niche, 11.30 to 2 on Saturday. People bring snacks because the bar is not really open, but Leah will be here to uh, sell people non-alcoholic drinks and coffee and tea, but people bring um, snacks to share because we're there from 11.30 to 2. And in that time, you'll do three to four timed writing exercises and there'll be time for feedback. And then we will do, do much the same thing, except without the coffee and tea, Monday night in this room uh, at Banks Gallery. And if there's people here that have taken before, don't take my word for it, ask them. And Rob is one. Bruce has done it before. Lori's done it. There's other people. Denise and Kathy have been here. And yeah, so. Uh, but I do appreciate that people mention uh, the work at, at Ghost Town. I really appreciate that they want to do that. Um, okay, so our next reader is going to be, you know, we tell um, people that we met at the library and tell them you can find, you know, love at the public library, because that's where Tony and I met. Back in 2003, 2004, when Vancouver was fucking boring, and nothing was happening, and you probably could still find parking, and didn't have to pay for as much of it as you have to pay for now, uh, the only place really to do poetry stuff was at the library for a little while. Uh, for the library, and um, so many books that later became cover to cover books, but I didn't know about that yet. So I went over to the library to find out who were the writers in town. Are there writers in this fucking town? And I met Diane, and I met probably Jim was there, Eileen Elliott, and the woman who had become so important to my life, Tony, uh, all at the library. And they did a workshop, and they did an open mic. And I don't mind telling you the open mic was boring. It was really, like the town was at the time, it was really boring over there at the library. So one of the reasons that we're all here today is because I thought to myself, this is really boring, even though I don't know anybody and nobody knows me, I could do a better job than this, so I'm going to find a place to have a, an open mic that's fun. 
So what do you think? Has yeah. it been fun? Are you having a good time? <laughs> so anyway, that's a long-winded way. What? Not as fun as the library. Not as fun as the library. Jim, get off my case, Jim. I'm not telling people not to go to the library. I'm just saying that one particular open mic is boring. I hope everyone supports the library. The library is great. You, and you can find the person who you'll spend your life with at the library if you go there. Uh, yes, so I've known Jim long enough that I can, yeah, fuck with him a little bit. You don't really want to fuck with Jim, but I could probably get away with it. Okay, so that's a long-winded way of saying that this wonderful person is about to come and share some poetry. One of my oldest friends here in Vancouver, Diane Cameron. Right. Woo! So, so I just have a couple of short poems, and part of the reason for that is that I want to let everybody know, if you don't know already, that there is the August Poetry Postcard Fest that is going to start in August. Um, you can still sign up for it until July 19th, and it costs $11 and change, um, again, August Poetry Postcard Fest. And what happens is um, your name and address goes on a list, and for the month of August, you write one poem per day, in theory, and um, you put it on a postcard and you mail it to somebody on the list and there's 30 people on your list. So every day you're mailing out a postcard to someone on this list somewhere in, somewhere in the world. And um, so I've gotten postcards from Korea, from um, Poland, from uh, the Netherlands, from Canada, and certainly from Washington because it did start originally here. And so I've done it for a couple of years, gave it a break, and so I've signed up again for it this year. And um, it challenges you because you have to write short poems. And that can be tricky for some people, and certainly was for me. Um, so I've got two poems here that I'd like to read. Um, jeans, frayed at the cuff, slung low, too low. Postcard says, wish you were but not here, not in this crowd of milling children, ice cream smiles, quick stops and starts. You have money? Worth mom, stop pushing. From behind, perfect ponytail, swings, reveals, bullfrog tattoo, back of tan neck, diamond studs, chains, and gold sandals, brush against jeans, frayed at the cock. And this one was um, one of the postcard ones that I did. Um, so imagine the front of the postcard was from the uh, um, Long Beach Kite Festival. So lots of kites on the front of this postcard. It's called Gravity Bound Charlie. The wind is always full of hope, filling nylon pockets with invisible grace. Twisting colorful tails, spiral loops to jump to the moon. But poor old Charlie's not ready for the big time. Thirty feet high, then diving, swooping, crashing. We run full speed for a blast off, and he nudges skyward. He makes the choices, and today he dreams his dreams are closer to the ground. <laughs> So yeah, I love postcard poetry. Um, I'm doing it this summer too, but I took a really long break from it. The last time I did it was 2009, I think. Uh, and I know what people are thinking, like you think, I couldn't possibly write that much, or I couldn't come up with something new to say every day. And what I learned from it is that we're all capable of producing more than we think. It doesn't mean that you're gonna write 30 poems that you love, and that you think are amazing. But that's not really the point of the thing. There were a lot more by the time I got to the end of the month, though, that I thought were usable. And it's also just fun because one of the rules or guidelines is you're not supposed to edit. I'm sure that people cheat, but those people are assholes. You should just do what they ask you to do and write a spontaneous poem. You can edit it 30 seconds after you put it in the mailbox. It's not like you're not allowed to edit. You're just not supposed to edit before you put it on the postcard. So it's a great challenge, and then at the end of the month, you have 30 poems, and some of them might be usable, some of them might be okay. It's also like 
Yeah, uh, when I do these workshops and when I meet people or work with people as an editor, I hear a lot, I have nothing to say or I, I, I don't, I'm not inspired, I can't think of anything to write about, I hear that a lot. Having to do it every day for 30 days teaches you that you're wrong about that and you're lying to yourself about it. Uh, so, and then you also, so the thing is, maybe you won't ever in your life be writing poems every single day, but doing it for 30 days teaches you that you could do it more than you're doing it right now. <laughs> so, yeah, give it a whirl, it's fun. Oh, and uh, the last count from Paul Nelson, the uh, organizer, I think they have 11 groups of 30 going, and uh, in my group I have one address is Ireland, and another one is in Canada. So yeah, it's really cool to, uh, and actually, you know, I figured I would know somebody on the list. I don't have any names on my list of Pacific Northwesterners that I know. So it's going to be cool. Um, and uh, next, for the open mic, we're going to hear from someone who's known Diane much longer than any of us have, Genevieve Cameron. Come on up, Genevieve. <laughs> beads of sweat on his temples, flinching with each dip of the dirt road, nitroglycerin and gunpowder piled high in the wooden frame, though your nerves don't know this. You wish not for a cave-in, but the split earth forging of mountains, the acceleration of folded outcrops, but a confession of love does not command an explosion, the echo of blast-shattered boulders, the surging mass of crumbled dust. It demands nothing. Not even an answer. And uh, the second one I wrote a few years ago. It's called Seize the Fucking Day. <laughs> and when I go to that place, I have to remind myself I am not there. Reach out to touch the stippled walls. Fix my eyes on the scuff marks on the floor from when I tried to push the bookshelf back to its corner. Close my eyes and count each breath, slowly, shaking, reminding myself I am here with plastic stars on my ceiling, wondering how, when my heart is bursting, my pulse refuses to pause, coursing blood through this body, how my brain was trying to kill me and still begged me to believe in life, my future, myself. And I think I am mostly beautiful when I am breaking, but not because I am breaking, but because I am growing. A sprout leaning toward an artificial sun I fastened out of new reasons when the old one imploded. And I don't know how to tell you I had to fight for this moment and will for the next one, will myself to go to the sock drawer, open it, take out two socks and put them on, one, at a time. I pick the ones that say carpe the fuck out of this diem. And let me tell you, if I start sobbing 15 minutes into cleaning bathrooms, I will not hide or numb or delude myself. I know what's out there. I know what an uphill battle looks like from the Marianas Trench. And when I'm still swimming upward at 35,000 feet deep, all I want is to stare down at these words on soaked socks and say, I fucking did. Okay, not only was that Genevieve's first time at Ghost Town Poetry Open Mic, she said it was her first time doing that anywhere. So Woo! I think because there's been so many people I've come through that sometimes I forget that someone's around there, it's been a long time, and I, just separate from that issue, that kicked ass, so thank you, and please come back, I hope you're able to come back and do that again. Yeah, we really, Tony talked about this a little bit, one of the things we really love about doing this is being a place for people to do it for the first time, because I don't know how many open mics you've been to at this point, but they're not all friendly, I'll just put it that way, so. This is a good place for it to be your first time to do this, and we're happy to be it. 
Okay, and uh, next we are going to hear from Brittany Braswell. Come on up, Brittany. but I read it for my best friend and she emailed me an old poem that I wrote at the beginning of my divorce and she's like, hey, do you remember this? And um, growth and healing is amazing, so I thought I'd read those both for you guys tonight. I'm gonna start with the old one. So bear with me because I've never read off my phone either, so. All right. I just want to be loved by a man like that. Men are filled with spoken words, but few follow through with action. Most of them lustful while you're searching for passion. Tearing out blouses without permission. Given in when you have nothing left but submission. I am constantly searching for gentle kisses, heartfelt good wishes. I just want to be loved by a man like that. But instead, man after man with hidden intent. So many goodbyes when I would not give my consent. I knew I just knew to a good man that would matter. While other girls lathered themselves in the sweat of many man, men's lust a man would find something special about that I was only his, a special trust. I just want to be loved by a man like that. But as I held on to what I felt was special, I fell in love with the man who handed his out like it was pretzels. While I longed for one, he longed for many. Maybe after a while he would change, eventually he would have plenty. Then we would build a family, create a castle, there would be true love after all this hassle. I just want to be loved by a man like that. Quickly two became three, to four, and then five. Sometimes I cannot believe how quickly time flies. That love I wanted so badly blossomed so bright. It became my flame and his flame. Two torches became one to create a beautiful light. The glow of the fire so bright it embeds itself upon one's soul. I just want to be loved by a man like that. Does love like that ever last? That love I fought so hard for is already a thing of the past. This dot on the timeline of my life, sometimes I ache that he had the pleasure of calling me his wife. I wanted so badly someone that cared, someone that wanted to pick apart the pieces of me that wanted me to share. I just want to be loved by a man like that. Our silent days filled my head with so many words I feel like I might explode, but instead of letting the words out, we both keep them in. Every cell of my being is imploding, but you still do not see me. I want to come through the door and be noticed by a man, maybe even a guy who would even let out a hot damn. I just want to be loved by a man like that. I want to have every part of my body so memorized by a man that he could decode me in his sleep. Every time he climbed between my legs, he gave and did not take, helping me build up all the insecurities I created to make me whole again. I just want to be loved by a man like that. The only time you look at me in the eye is when you are on top of me, ripping away pieces of my soul. I live in fear of where you will dig at me, where will be the next hole. The days always turn into nights, the calm always turns into fights. There's a silent rage always burning, your resentfulness towards me the coal, but my insecurities keep the weight of it all in my soul. I long for something more, all I have to do is walk out that door. The taste of something so soul-fulfilling has me twisted in knots. Is there more to this life? Is it worth a shot? I just want to be loved by a man like that. So fearful I am being ungrateful for what I got. Some women cry with battered bodies while I cry over a battered heart. If I run, will life be better? Or will I find out that there can be way worse stormy weather? Will I find the love that is meant for me? I just want to want someone to come in and actually care about my day. Someone that laughs at all the quirky things I say. It would be nice if my new hairdo was noticed. A shoulder massage here and there would be a huge bonus. I just want to be loved by a man like that. I want to be more to a man than just a body. I am not just someone to come to me when you're feeling naughty. I lay awake at night after you fall asleep thinking of being loved better. Someone who supports me for all that I am. Someone who does not criticize everything I have been. I just want to be loved by a man like that. Obviously, obviously my soul needs so much healing. I have so much ahead of me, but I am dealing. I have come to realize there's one me, and that is it. 
so I can't let it be wasted feeling like shit. My soul has been empty, but daily I feel more free. I am picking up all the pieces that make up the beautiful picture of me. My heart has a missing piece where I know one day he will fit, and I totally know it is going to sound too fairy booky to say it, but one day I would just love to be loved by a man like that. Yeah. Woo.